I'm going to just start by telling you a little bit about me and why I'm here today. I think obviously you know there's been a local, local uh, death that usually is why I get brought in. So unfortunately, I'm that person that they are like, oh, we got to call Dr. Rickard. But the, the truth is, is that I, for years, have been in this community for about 14 years. And when I started off, welcome, come on in. Um, so when I started off in this community, one of the things that was really lacking was mental health resources. And I came in from Wisconsin for about 14 years ago, and what I can say is I was one of uh, a few psychologists in our area. There was really um, no one else. I helped set up the behavioral medicine program at Columbia Valley, which started with just me. I then developed a, a doctoral level internship as well as postdoctoral residency. Um, I went on to Confluence Health and then integrated all four counties with, with uh, an integrated program that involves now 17 medical practices and now I am the executive director over at American Behavior Health Systems Parkside which is a crisis stabilization unit for adults. It's also as of next week we're opening an uh, acute withdrawal uh, unit which is basically a detox, a medical detox, so something that we have not had in our region ever. So um, my, my work has predominantly been in mental health and kind of working to help people that are in uh, states of crisis. The, the goal today really is that you leave feeling informed about what's current state for youth, but really this information is general. What we know is that this isn't unique information um, to just youth, it's really about a population of understanding what is um, involved in suicide prevention. So I hope you, you gain some of that knowledge today. The other thing I hope is at the end of this that you're able to understand some of the resources and that you feel free to ask some questions that maybe you don't get a chance to ask very often because you don't have someone that you can ask those questions of. So um, hopefully this will at least be the start of something that can begin to heal this community and the youth that are living within it. So we're just going to begin by kind of w walking through some statistics. I think statistics, while they're not always fun to look at, I think they're important because it gives you a baseline of where we are at and what's um, happening in our local area. Um, so just kind of when we look at United States data, when I started doing this presentation, I founded the Suicide Prevention Coalition back in 2012 when we had a really bad year of, of suicides. Um, back then, when I started the presentation, there were in the United States 35,000 deaths by suicide. Currently, um, today we're at 47,000 uh, deaths per year, which is about 13.5 uh, deaths per 100,000. So when we look at suicide data, it's always per 100,000. And then it's about one death every 13 minutes, and it is the 10th leading cause of death for all age groups. So this next slide really is the different age groups and where uh, suicide falls. What you'll notice is, uh, I'll help you because I'm sure that is very blurry, but um, the first column is your 10 to 14 year olds. So second leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds. The first one is unintentional injury for both the, the first three columns. Um, and then the next group is 15 to 24, then uh, 25 to 34. So again, second leading cause for all three of those groups. When we put all age groups together, we're at 10th leading cause. So I think surprising when we think about all the ways people could die and for youth, second leading cause. When we look at the United States map, this map has really not changed over the years uh, a whole lot. What you'll notice is the darkest states are really the most rural states, right? And so when we think about um, the states that have some of the highest suicide rates, they're oftentimes the highest because it's the hardest to access care. So when you have to really get to some place and it takes you a lot of effort to get there either by gas, by time, or by just effort. When you think about someone who's struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety, struggling with mental health, and then it's going to take them an hour of their time just to kind of get themselves together, get in the shower, put gas in the car, and then drive, it's, it's too arduous and oftentimes they can't seem to get themselves together to get to those appointments. When we look at our state by county, what you'll notice is that Okanagan, out of our four county region, so when we think about us regionally, we are Okanagan, Grant, Chelan, and Douglas. And the reason for that is that when we look at um, kind of 
medical care. Medical care has predominantly come down into the Chelan and Douglas area from those regions. And as of this past year, so uh, January 1st, all mental health care was able to kind of get care wherever they wanted, which is also new for our area. It's never happened uh, prior to this. So when we look at Okanagan, we can see that they have a very high rate. They have predominantly always had a, a high rate. Chelan and Douglas are interesting because what you see is it looks like Douglas County is doing better, but what we know is that there is no hospital located in Douglas County, so where you die, you are counted. So if someone gets flown to the hospital then wherever they may pass is where their number is going to count so it skews data for some of the counties in the state and it also skews the funding that they might get based on that so um, I think that's um, pr predominantly it's been difficult for some of the counties um, this is kind of looking at prior to the the inception of the coalition. What we see is in 2006 all the way up to about 2010, our numbers stayed fairly steady. I went back into the 70s and 80s and looked at suicide data, and what I saw was that pretty much our, our data was predominantly around 10 to 13. So we were always around those numbers. Then you see that there was a spike in 2010. What I know was happening in the background was that our mental health system, there was a change in, at the time we called it a regional support network. That regional support network uh, ended up uh, changing and kind of changing local providers and moving into um, bringing an outside provider in from Arizona. At that time, what happened was 500 patients got lost to follow up. They never showed back up on any of the mental health radars. So um, what we see is kind of a spike in, in rates at that time. By 2012, the first six weeks of the year, we had um, six deaths. And then very shortly after that, we had an additional six deaths. In that time, six of them were youth. It was unprecedented. We had never, ever had a year where we had lost so many youth. So when we look at that type of data, it's one of those things that I think in the community, it was the first time that the community started saying, who's going to do something about the suicide in our area? When we look at adult deaths, what happened was that I think most people felt like it was, it, there was nothing we could do. You know, these people are dying, they're making their choice, there's nothing we could do. But when the youth got involved, all of a sudden people said, well, what are we going to do? And it changed the conversation. It was the first time we were actually looking at why is this okay for us. And so I, I think it was a good conversation to have and we needed to have it. By the end of the year, 11 youth died that year. So uh, when we look at it by gender, what you see, and predominantly males tend to be more lethal. So when they make attempts, they use lethal means, so they tend to die by suicide more often. The females tend to make more attempts with uh, less lethal means, so it takes more effort. When we get into suicide by ages, what you'll notice is that the yellow is our 0 to 14, the red is the 15 to 24. It's not uncommon that when we look at suicide statistics that we have a cutoff around age 24. And that is based on the maturation of the brain, right? So the impulse control ceases around that time. And what we see is a, a general decline in the rates for the, age, the next age group. Um, so uh, ultimately, what we would like to see is no red and no yellow on our graph or I, my, my preference is that we move towards a zero suicide and that our graphs are just empty. Um, then the last one, what you'll notice is that we have a 60 plus, so the light blue is really high and we tend to be double. So seniors tend to have, um, we know seniors are the highest uh, group, so they make about four attempts in general um, to the adult population is about 25 attempts before they have a completion. So seniors tend to be very lethal planners in the way they operate. In our area, we have a real problem. So we've had some senior facility deaths that are um, something that the coalition has been working on. And then uh, in general, for all uh, age groups over 60, we are working on some prevention matters. So one of the things that we're doing, so PBS NewsHour just recently showed up. They uh, are doing uh, a pilot on our um, 
model that we're implementing into Katie Glenn. And so part of the work is in how do we prevent suicide and, and we're creating a mentor model. Um, so similar to peer models, we're using um, peers in senior facilities to help prevent suicides of other members because we know they'll be the first ones to find out if something's going wrong. And then similar for the teens, the suicide prevention group is doing, we have two work groups right now. One of them is our universal screening work group, which is um, the goal of this is to work out a best practice model that could be implemented into any middle school or high school, and then work on a curriculum that would be prevention based versus postvention. So I do a lot of postvention work and my goal is to get into the prevention piece of things. And then um, the other work group is a focus group of teens that are coming together to create marketing around suicide prevention for teens. So what we learned most recently, there was a death in Wenatchee and what we learned was that um, there was information on a gaming channel that the adults in this child's life could not get to and nor could the police actually because it was on a site that no one knew about except for the other youth and so what we learn is that as we age we are no longer aligned with our our kids because they're into things that we are not into and so it behooves us to be figuring out what they're doing and then marketing to them in those places so that we are reaching them in a way that actually works so the, the high risk groups that we are targeting as a coalition tends to be the veterans. So the veterans in our area have a rate and I think nationally they have a rate of about 20 per 100,000. Teens, uh, we've talked about the seniors. And then the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer and questioning. We know 50% of, of LGBTQQ will uh, attempt suicide. So really high rates there. Trans uh, youth are at about 80% rate of, of attempts so it's really important that we're reaching out and then vulnerable populations tends to be those that are homeless or um, struggling in some way so when we look at statistics I'm just going to kind of run through so we know that suicidal thoughts and planning are higher for the 18 to 34 year olds about 20 percent of teens will consider suicide at any given time about five to eight percent will actually make an attempt 90% is based on some sort of mental health and or substance use. When we look back at the year where we had 30 deaths, so in 2012, 29 of those people and youth, so all the youth but one, had a substance on board at time of death. We know that the way the brain works is that your brain is all about survival. If a, if a substance, including marijuana or any other substance, was not on board, your brain would be able to fight for survival and, and, and work towards that. And so what we know is that if they hadn't been using that substance, they likely would also be alive. Most youth believe that their issues won't get better. Teens tend to believe, right, they have that impulse control that's happening in their life, so they don't think that whatever happened, this emotional moment that they're having in their life will ever improve. And then all of a sudden, five minutes later, their friend calls and they're like, hey, how's it going, right? And things change like a whirlwind. But in that moment, they really believe that this is the way it's going to be. And, and when you're a parent or a loved one, and you're like, no, you know, we've been through that, I've been through this, they can't hear you, right? I mean, we're in a different place for them. So teens less isolated and more supported do better. So we know that creating support, developing support helps youth. It's one of the very strong predictors of youth that do well are youth that are surrounded by adults in their life. And that can be the coach, it can be teachers, it can be providers, it can be any of the adults that, you know, close-knit family, you know, that it's the saying, it takes a village. It really does take a village. So suicide is preventable. So, you know, things that we commonly will hear from youth, um, you know, the feelings that will never end, Things will always be this bad. I will never have another girlfriend or boyfriend. The pain just won't stop. Life will never be the same. I will never get past this embarrassment. Bullying will always happen. I will never have control, right? So these are not uncommon types of statements that we're having. <laughs> I can't read, that's my problem. <laughs> So, so why suicide? So suicide we know is always multi-determined. It's not uncommon that people believe that it's one thing, right? It's bullying, it's something that happens in someone's life that made this happen. The truth is, is that 
It's, it's always multifactorial. It's never just that one thing. It's not because you chose not to call or you chose not to, to post a thank you or whatever the, the person feels as guilt. There's lots of things that people feel after the loss. I have to tell you personally, my mom attempted over the holiday season. I was in an airplane. She called me and said goodbye. And so it's that moment where you land and then I find out and it's that place where you just go, ugh, you know? I had no idea it was a goodbye. I was on a plane leaving, of course it was goodbye. I had no idea that it was a translation to I'm actually leaving. So it's that place where you have to kind of say, what, what is it that people might be feeling? And I think as a school, as a community, as you start to wrap around this problem, part of wrapping around it is recognizing that one of the, one of the myths that we have is that with youth, we often think that the youth that are most impacted are the ones that were in the circle of the person that died. What research shows is that all youth in the school are at risk for two years post-death. Two years, the risk is up in that community. So I think we have to be careful about selecting people to do certain things because the truth is, is all the age groups in that school are at a greater risk. And the younger they tend to be, the greater the risk because the more they struggle with thinking about how to, to make sense of what's happening to them. And especially if they don't have people that are willing to have honest conversations about some of the things that are happening and why would someone do that and what, what does that mean and how come I feel this way and how does guilt play a role. And so I think we have to be able to have some of those conversations. So access to lethal means is a problem because we know, so when we look at the six youth that died very early in 2012, all of them had access to the means that, that was available. All of them had it in their home. People think because their guns are locked up, now I want you to hear, I'm not opposed to having weapons. I'm opposed to having people that have mental health issues have access to weapons, and I'm opposed to anybody 24 and under having free access to weapons. Because the impulse control, when someone breaks up with someone and they think, this is it, I want to die, then it's that thought that doesn't get repaired until it's too late, because it can't be repaired. What we know is access to means, so there was some research done in the UK where they had uh, poisonous gas that was in, in their ovens. And so what they did was they swapped out the gas for a non-poisonous alternative. And, and at that point, people would just stick their head in the, in the oven and boom, they're dead. Once they did that, what they found was that the suicide rate dropped and it never rose, rose back up. They didn't replace that method with a different means, right? What we know is the same thing happens with weapons or any other type of mean that might be whatever they're going to choose, right? When you take that away, the access away, it doesn't get replaced. Very rarely does it get replaced. So we know about 5% will go on and choose a second method, but the majority of them will not go on and choose another method if that means is inaccessible. 83% of youth who get lethal doses of medicine got them from their grandparents, got them from people in their life. 86% of youth are known to have the ability to get into the gun safe without any issue. So again, are, are they really unable to access the weapons at home, even though the parents think they do? Um, the use of substances, I talked about that. Mental health issues unaddressed. So while 93% of the people that die by suicide have a mental health issue, usually depression, at the time of death, it does not mean that if you're depressed that you're going to die by suicide, right? So while people that are dying by suicide likely have some form of depression or mental health diagnosis. Bullying, I get this often as bullying the cause. Again, bullying is a factor that plays a significant role in people's life. And when you're already vulnerable, when you're already struggling, it's that thing that won't stop and it won't go away. And it often makes you feel powerless and like other people are not listening and you don't have control. And so yes, it can play a role and it's something that should be managed if it's happening at the school level, if it's happening at home, if it's happening in any environment, it shouldn't be allowed. One of the things that's unique, so unlike when I was growing up, you know, bullying was me and someone chest bumping me and let's go at it. But nowadays, it's on your phone. 
It's online. It's in front of lots and lots of people. And it's the cyberbullying has taken on a whole new way uh, of being. And it's changed how youth have to think about their world. And so we want to be cautious about how we're addressing it and what that ends up looking like. So loss of perceived or actual relationships. So sometimes youth will believe that something's over, this is it, this is the last thing. And as adults, we might say, you know, we know they're going to be back together in half a day. And most of the time, they are back together in half a day. But the truth is, is that we have to be mindful about what that is, right? It's their truth. It's their reality. And, and we still have to acknowledge it. I think sometimes as adults, we're like, oh, we've been there, done that. But in that, you're blowing them off and you're not acknowledging where they're at in their life. So part of being a good friend, part of being a, a, a youth support is really hearing where they're at and what they're going through, even if it feels like it's the 50th time, right? So, um, and then impulsivity, right? We know impulsivity plays a large role. The majority of youth death is based off of this one trait. So I'm going to go through some of the myths. I think it's important. One of the things that we know is that a lot of people have some thoughts about suicide and whether you can talk about it, whether you can't talk about it. And it really plays a large role in how people move forward and talk about suicide to other people because they have these kind of misguided myths, I would say. So the first one is no one can stop a suicide, it's inevitable. One of the things that research shows is that if people get good help at the time that they need it, they'll probably never go on to attempt again because in the getting of good help, what happens is you learn that I'm helpable, right? That I can be helped, that this moment can change. And so what we see is the research shows is that many of those people, if they've, they've gotten the right help at the right time, they won't go on to, to futuristically kind of hurt themselves. Confronting a person about suicide will only make them angry and increase the risk of suicide. This is probably the number one question I get is that, oh, you know, I'm really afraid to talk to people about suicide. What if I ask and they get mad at me? What if I ask and they don't like it? Well, first of all, we're talking about a really serious thing. If you really believe that someone may be suicidal, this is life or death, right? But the truth is, is that I have never had this conversation and have someone kind of get really mad and come at me and be like, whoa, well, what are you thinking? Ask me about suicide. <laughs> You know, I mean, usually they just break down and cry. If I got it, if I was right and I said, you know, I'm really worried about you, I care about you, or I don't know you, but you look like something was really going on, or are you okay? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? They usually just melt because I hit it, right? Most people are so afraid to have that conversation that they just go, oh, I'm so glad someone's asking me that question. And then they just start to melt because they can tell that you genuinely are willing to have that conversation. If you're the person that's like, no, um, well, you know, you good, you good, then what happens is they kind of read your trepidation, and then they think, oh, you're not okay about me having this conversation, so I'm going to have to lie to you to make you okay. But if we don't have to do that for them, and we can just be like, hey, I'm worried about you, are you okay? And we say it confidently, what happens is they will answer the way they feel, and they'll tell you, and you'll know whether it's the truth or it's not the truth. So we know that it, it relieves them. Most people feel immediately, I mean, without doing anything. I mean, it's hard for me to say, well, you know, my, my patients leave feeling better, but, you know, <laughs> assuming it wasn't me, most people that have that conversation feel better just because it's like having that balloon that's filling, 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 and it's just getting so tight. And then you have that conversation, and it's like a little pinhole of air that just kind of slowly leaks out. They just start to feel better without much of anything. There's no magic that happens other than they got to have a real conversation and it's out of their head and not ruminating, right? It's now being shared with someone. Only experts can prevent suicide. Suicide prevention is everybody's business and anyone can help. What we know is that anybody, so when we look at scope of practice, so anybody can have a conversation about suicide. If you're a medical assistant, then you can't talk to someone about treatment. That's a provider's job. It's a nurse's job. So a nurse and above can talk about treatment. Medical assistants, CNAs can ask about suicide. Anybody can ask about suicide. We have a duty in our community now 
to ask about suicide if you are worried about someone that you know, and even if you don't know. So absolutely, you want to, everybody's job is to prevent suicide. Suicidal people keep their plans to themselves. Most suicidal people will com communicate intent at some point during the proceeding of some sort of attempt. What we know is that the majority of people will leave clues or they'll make statements or they'll make comments ahead of time. In school, it's not uncommon that you might see it in some of the changes in papers that they will write. They'll make little drawings. They'll do certain things to let people know they're feeling bad, right? Something's going on. They want other people to know. And sometimes they'll, they'll say it, and sometimes they'll give you clues to saying it. The problem is, is we've come up with ways to make everything, oh, well, you know, they didn't really mean that. And in my house with my kids, if they make a comment about wanting to die or wishing they were dead, it's mommy time. I stop what I'm doing and I say, let's go talk. Let, let me hear what's happening. Because part of this is about recognizing that we have to pause and we can't make casual language okay. It can't be okay to say, oh, I just wish I was dead. That's not okay anymore. We've got to stop our friends. We've got to stop our kids from talking like that because when they talk like that, casually, we'll never know when it's real. So part of this is about making sure there's specificity in language. So those who talk about suicide don't do it. People who talk about suicide may try and even complete an act of suicide. We know that people will follow it through, and some people will talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, and then they will do it. And some people will talk about it and talk about it and never do it because maybe someone intervened, maybe something stopped them. We know that the majority of people, there's lots of research on people that have made attempts that they regret it the minute they make that attempt. But it's too late if they've chosen a lethal means. So once a person decides to complete suicide, there's nothing anyone can do. We know that suicide's very preventable. There's lots and lots of research on it, on how preventable it is. So it's important that we're just having these conversations and we're going through it again and again. If a suicidal youth tells a friend, the friend will access help. This is where we get confused and I think sometimes we believe that the youth that hear about it are gonna do what we as adults might think is, you know, they're going to come to you or they're going to come to someone that they trust. The, we know that peer groups are really rock solid and that the youth do not share this information even if it's lethal. They will hold it. And because of that, it's really hard. And so part of the education, part of the work that we have to do is that we have to make it okay for them to break that code of silence. But there has to be a chain that happens so that they know what that is. And it can't be a failed chain, right? So there's been some schools that I've been involved with that, you know, there's been some punitive actions that felt the students felt when they did come forward. And so when that happened, it taught the other students never to come forward. And so we have to be cautious about what that looks like. And, and help students get to a place where they're willing to come forward when we create different pathways. And part of that is just thinking through some of the stuff. So we're gonna get into kind of what are some of the suicidal uh, clues and warning signs. Our, our biggest thing is making sure that we're taking everything serious. QPR is um, based by Paul <coughs> Burnett, and he is uh, a researcher and a psychologist that's out of Spokane. He came up with QPR, and it's based off of CPR, right? So it's question, persuade, refer. And, you know, I think he's done a great job of kind of putting this uh, information together. So suicide clues and warning signs. We know that uh, threats to hurt or kill him or herself. And I think sometimes we think, well, that, that will be obvious, but what I've seen in my, my patients or in the families of patients is that they hear the threats and then they go, oh, no, it's, it's, they're fine. It's just a moment. They're just having a moment, right? And I think our thing is, is, again, we can't allow those kind of moments. You've got to stop and, and never kind of just say, well, it's okay to talk like that because then we never really know and there's always this lingering doubt. Current talk of suicide or making a plan, you know, it's, it's rare that someone's just going to outwardly share it unless you've asked, unless you're part of the peer group. 
A strong wish to die or preoccupied with death. This is where what you hear is a change in maybe some of the music that they're listening to, a change in how they start to write. Are they not going to classes? Uh, you know, part of what we look for is a baseline change away from how they have always been. Now, if they're always the person that struggles to get up and go to class, then looking at that as a, as a change is probably not going to be the clue you're going to be seeing. But if they were always engaged with their friends and all of a sudden now they're pulled back and not engaging or they're fighting with all their friends, that might be a clue. Right? If they used to get up all the time and be waiting to go to school and now they're sleeping in and not wanting to go to school, that's probably a clue. So we're looking for the change away from baseline. Strong wish to die, anxious and depressed, not sleeping. Not sleeping, when we think about youth that don't sleep, I mean, it's not uncommon, right? What we know is youth actually need more sleep than the average person. So our goal is to push more sleep, but when we see them going for days without sleep, or, you know, I see a lot of families that have youth with their phones all night long. You know, my personal, um, what I teach, teach my patients is, you've got to check the phone in at night, you know, 10 p.m. You check that phone in so they can relax their brain. If they're not, they're waiting, that phone's buzzing all night long and they're up looking at their text because they got to be the first. Part of being in the in-group is having that. But what happens is, if they are, they're not sleeping. So what we see is a higher rate of disengagement because the mental health is able to seep in when they're not sleeping, right? I mean, it's, their, it's that cognitive issue that goes with lack of sleep. Ab abusing substances, we've talked about this. Um, and then no reason to live or no purpose in life, right? I mean, it's not uncommon for youth to sometimes feel like, I just want to give up. You know, my son's 11, I just heard that. He said, life is just so hard. And the truth is, is life is just so hard, right? But part of the work that we've got to do is teach resiliency skills, teach frustration tolerance. The problem with technology is that it doesn't teach boredom. It doesn't teach frustration tolerance, right? Because everything's right now immediate. But the truth is, is solving problems isn't immediate. But they're living in a world where everything's immediate and everything's just given. And when that happens, we don't build the resiliency that we need to weather some things that take emotional time, right? So we have to help them with what does that look like. Feeling trapped with no way out, withdrawing from friends, family, and society, anger, irritability, engaging in high-risk behavior. So this could be going and doing things that they don't normally do. It could be skipping school. It could be driving fast. Um, it could be using, using substances. Anger is a moving emotion, so what we often see is that they will push people away as a way to say, see, no one loves me. Or, you know, it doesn't matter now because now they're all mad at me, so now I'm free to go do what I want to do. And so, you, you know, anger is an interesting emotion, so when, we, when you go from someone who might be depressed and they're kind of lethargic to all of a sudden pissed off, on one hand, it's a good thing if we're talking about healing and moving and they're working with someone. It's not a good thing if they're kind of the, the person that's trying to isolate because it allows them in their brain to say, you know what, now I can do it. Statements of hopelessness and despair. We know hopelessness is one of the key factors to people that complete suicide. So it's important that we're looking at it. If we have someone that feels like things are hopeless, that we're really, really taking that serious. Isolation is another one, and I'm a burden is another one. Right? So when we look at those things, those things are key to someone that is, has a high risk of completing. So what might you hear directly? So we know I've decided to kill myself, I wish I were dead, I'm going to commit suicide, I'm going to end it all, if such and such doesn't happen, I'll kill myself, leaving a message on social media, right? So any of those could be left. So there was, um, I told the story last week, what we had was a youth that, uh, I had a whole youth group that came to one of my trainings and the, this mom brought a whole group of youth that were concerned the student at school had been making lots and lots of comments about wanting to die and that if, you know, he was the, he was the jock, he was a good looking guy, and he had lots of friends, he was a straight A student, so he was all the things that we don't think about someone who would want to die. And yet he was telling everybody, he told his coach, he told his teachers, he told his friends, he posted it on Facebook, that if they didn't win the championship, he was going to hang himself from the hoop. And of course what happened was they didn't win the championship. 
And so he had uh, gone and hidden the school. He had uh, taken away, uh, he'd waited for everybody to go away. The, the janitor left for the day, closed up the building, and then here he was still in the school. What ended up happening was he went, he realized it's too dark, he had to go flip on some lights. Well, the janitor happened to be driving by and was like, I swear I turned those lights off, came in and found him climbing up a ladder. Thankfully, right? So he had a good ending, but he went away to an inpatient facility and then I ended up working with the family. But the, the truth is, is that he's not alone, right? He didn't fit the mold. He couldn't have told any more people to get that story right. He told everybody. And they didn't know what to do because he didn't fit the mold. So everybody thought, you know, why would someone that is so good looking, I hear that all the time, why would someone who's so good looking kill themselves? Are you kidding me? So only other people kill themselves? I mean, really? I mean, we, we think when you ask people who's, who's likely to die, they'll point to a homeless person. You know, but I have to tell you, the list in 2012 involves political people. It involves executives. It involves doctors. People that we wouldn't think would, would hurt themselves because they don't fit our mold of who we think should be doing it. Well, he as a student didn't fit that mold either. And yet he felt totally alone. And so I think, you know, it's that, it's that saying where I'm alone in a group, right? And so he felt very alone. I think the social messaging, you know, we've had a lot of things that have gotten posted. I think it's probably the number one question I get when I go to these things is youth coming to me and saying, I don't know what to do. My friend just posted this message. What should I do? You know, and, and part of it is that we have to take that stuff serious at the point that they're posting it in, in a social media site, right? I mean, they are letting everybody know there's something wrong. I mean, even if they're not going to follow it through, there's something wrong, right? I mean, we don't just post messages like that. So part of it is, even if it's a cry for help, it's how do we get help to that, that person and make sure that they are accessing. What I can tell you is, personally, I've had some of my own friends that have posted stuff, and I'm like, ring hello, let's have a conversation. Like, we've got to talk about what you just posted, and you need to take it down, so that we, and then let's get you help. So I think we should be also doing that when we hear those types of things. People should be wrapping around the youth and making sure that those things are taken care of. Indirect clues, I'm tired of life, I just can't go on, right? We, you know, it's not an uncommon statement. Think about that in isolation, right? When you think about that one statement, it, it's not uncommon where you think, oh, I'm just tired of life, I'm tired of things, things are hard. So what do we do in a, in, in a loan statement? We probably don't deal with it. We just wait. And we go, oh, they probably didn't mean it like that. My family would be better off without me. Very common. And I had a 13-year-old girl that gave away her family dog. For two weeks, that dog was missing out of that family. No one knew that that dog was gone. And then she decided, well, because no one in the family knew the dog was missing, they wouldn't miss her. And she was testing it because she loved the dog so much, she didn't want the dog left with the family. So she then attempted, she went away to inpatient, thankfully was not successful. And you know, then in a follow-up with the mom, you know, the mom finds out that the dog was missing during this appointment. She's like, I love that dog. How could you do that? And so I asked that girl, I said, I need you to step out. And then I had a really good conversation with the mom, which is that this is not okay. Like this is not okay. I mean, this is a girl who's struggling to, to find how you connect with her, and you're now just finding out that the dog has been missing now for, it was like, about five weeks, six weeks. And still, I mean, no thought. So this is reality for some of the youth that are in the schools, is they come from disconnected families. They come from families that are very chaotic. They come from places where they feel invisible. Part of coming to school is feeling visible having someone that connects with you so you feel like you make a difference. You have to have those people. So who cares? I just want out. I won't be around much longer. Pretty soon you won't have to worry about me. Behavioral clues. So uh, any previous suicide attempt, high risk predictor is a previous suicide attempt. And mostly it's, it's about resiliency, right? So if there's been 
a year or two years without an attempt or three. Sometimes I hear patients, oh, I haven't done it for five years. Then I think, oh, they've built up some resiliency. And I say, well, tell me when you did make those attempts, what were the, the issues you found driving you to make that attempt? And oftentimes you might find a theme, right? So it might be the one thing that they struggle to manage emotionally. You know, oftentimes it's a breakup or a loss or something. But I think those are the things that tend to drive it. But part of it is oftentimes if someone gets into therapy after, they learn the resiliency skills they need to kind of weather things. And, you know, most people hit that <coughs> place and they think, I don't have the skills to deal with what's happening in my life right now. Part of our job, our skill of working with our friends, of working with our family is to make sure that they know how do you get help. You don't have to have the answer for everything, right? I'm, as a leader of a business, I don't need to know all the answers for my business. I need to know how to find the answers for my business. That's the answer, but they don't know that, right? And so part of our job is to make sure that they know that. So acquiring a gun or stockpiling pills, being impulsive, increased risk taking, giving away prized possessions, self-destructive acts, so cutting. So cutting is one of those things that often gets equated as a suicide attempt. What we know and what research shows is that oftentimes people that do cut have more suicidal ideation, but the cutting is not often linked to suicidal attempts, right? Now, if you ask someone, did you cut because you want to die, then that's a different scenario. But most often, it's based on endorphins, right? So someone cuts, and they get this rush that happens in their brain, similar to taking opiates. So that endorphin rush really kind of manages the brain. And what they often feel is this rush, and then they get this sense of quiet that kind of happens after. And some people describe it as, I became present. So if there's a history of abuse, trauma, or something that would cause them to feel numb, oftentimes that cutting will create that sense of, kind of coming back in. It's not a great management tool, right? But it's like a drug, right? Think of it as an opiate. They do it because it manages whatever it is they're trying to manage. So until we can give them something better, that's how they're managing. And there is a subset of youth that, so my niece was one of them. So my brother called me and was like, oh, I don't know what to do. I, you know, she just cut. And then, but she was the kid that she cut, she came down, she's like, oh my God, I'm gonna die, this is it, right? And she'll never do it again because she didn't have any endorphins. <laughs> they didn't happen for her. So she, I told her, what was her reaction? You're good, it's not gonna happen. She won't do it again. And she has never done it because she, unfortunately for her, didn't, didn't have that reaction. Myself, I was happy. Chronic truancy, running away. So again, we're looking at differences. So if this is something that they don't normally do and now they're doing it, that's a change for them. Situational clues, so being expelled from school, fired from a job. Now this could be, now remember, this isn't always about the youth, right? It could be fired, someone in the family got fired and now it changes the dynamics that's happening in the household. Family problems or alienation, loss of any sort of major relationship. Now this could be a divorce. It could be a loss of, uh, you know, someone in a grandparent that dies. It could be someone moving away. So loss doesn't have to be a death. It could be someone moving away. Fear of a loss, um, death of a friend or a family member, especially if it is by suicide. A first degree family member dying by suicide creates a risk 65% higher for any first degree relative of someone who has died by suicide. It's a high risk. Diagnosis of a serious illness, right? So anything in the family. So again, if we're looking at the family, what happens, right? All resources go to this person that is ill in the family. So sometimes things get missed. If you're a youth in a family where someone might be ill, then what happens is they're away a lot, they're at appointments, they're getting chemotherapy, they're managing whatever disease process might be happening, and they're pulled away from having someone that might be supportive. Financial issues, so oftentimes financial issues land people in homelessness or near homelessness, having to move out of places, having to move to other places. Their risk of depression rises after age 13 if someone is moving, and especially if they're doing an unwanted move right, and having to change schools. You know, moving in the same neighborhood, probably 
not a big deal. But moving out of your neighborhood, bigger deal. And then moving out of the city, very big deal. So sudden loss of freedom, so this could be going to juvie or going to jail, going to prison, and it could be someone else in their family doing those things. Feeling embarrassed or humiliated in front of others by peers. So think about, you know, people posting negative messages on social media, right? This is a, not an uncommon experience for many people. Victim of assault or bullying, abuse, physical, sexual, verbal, and then bullying, cyber or in person. We know that youth that are in the foster system have a very high rate of completed suicides. So youth that are part of the foster system are at one of the greatest risks of all, all youth. So other areas of concern, so change in interaction with family or friends, recent disappointments or rejections, a sudden decline in any academic performance, so increased apathy, and then physical symptoms you might notice would be eating disturbances, right? Now, again, this is assuming that you know what the baseline is. It would be a change, so it could be overeating, undereating, changes in sleep patterns, chronic headaches, stomach problems, menstrual irregularities, and irritability. So it sounds very teenage-like. Right? So very hard to distinguish. So this is where it takes understanding how was this person prior? What do you notice that's different? So when we think about asking the question, right? So our, our goal is when we have this hint that something might be going on, it's about just having that early question, just asking the question. Um, I think some people, you know, I talk to and they say, well, I'm probably just not that person that can ask that question. You don't have to be that person to ask the question, but you have to find someone to, that you trust to have that question asked, right? So part of it is that if you know that's not you, then it's, it's about pointing to someone that can have that conversation. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing it in a private setting, so it's not uncommon that people in the middle of a public place are like, hey, just wondering, are you okay? I'm worried about you. And, and that person, there's no way they can help their guards <coughs> down. So in those types of settings, you can't do it. You know, you want to make sure that they can actually have a, the freedom to talk. So allow them to talk freely. I think today we, you know, I proceed with caution. I, you know, today I had to make sure my phone was off, right? So part of having those types of conversations is making sure that our electronics is not buzzing everywhere. Because the minute you look, a youth is going to think, you, you don't care. You don't want to be here with me. You're just worried about who's texting you. And so it's important to recognize that you've got dedicated time to this conversation. Having resources, so make sure that you know you're prepared. You've got the resources in your phone. There's a local resource um, information over on the table. I have it in my phone, so anybody who needs it immediately can get to it. Now, obviously, we can Google it, we can Syria, we can Alexa it, but um, you know it's important to just know what those resources are, so that you don't have to waste time getting them. So, a, a way to ask the question about suicide, so a less direct approach would be. Have you been uh, so unhappy lately that you've been thinking about ending your life? Do you ever wish that you could go to sleep and never wake up? A direct approach, you know, when people are as upset as you seem to be, they sometimes wish they were dead. I'm wondering if you're feeling that way too. You look pretty miserable. I wonder if you're thinking about suicide or hurting yourself. Are you thinking about killing yourself or wanting to die? I personally just say, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? One of those types of things. I just get straight to it. Because I don't want them to worry that maybe I'm worried about having that conversation. So the practice that you can give yourself by kind of rehearsing that in your head of how would you say that to someone? You know, oftentimes I'll just point out what I see, which is the obvious. You point out what you notice. You look like you're really struggling, or you look <clears> like you've been really sad lately. I'm worried about you. Are you thinking of hurting yourself? And you just notice it, and when you do that, what happens is if it's real and they've been thinking about that, it's relief that someone just asked that question. So how not to ask that question? You're not thinking of killing yourself, are you? You wouldn't do anything stupid, would you? And suicide is a dumb idea. Are you thinking about suicide? These came from parents. These came from people that 
have actually been in my office. It happens all the time. And I think we chuckle, but the truth is, is people talk that way because they don't really want to hear the real answer because we're afraid of the answer. And sometimes we, it's because we don't know what to do if we did get a positive. And so I think we have to not be afraid of that and work, walk that journey when we get there. So how do we persuade someone? So we ask the question, they said yes. Our job at, at the point that we've asked that question is to say, tell me about that. What's going on? What do, you, what do you think makes you feel that way? And just let them go. Medical providers spend less than three minutes letting a patient emote before they get interrupted. The average conversation before we interrupt is, is probably four or five minutes. It's important. The average person is trained because that's the world we now live in to make sure that we're you know, not interrupting. So we literally, if you just let a person go without interrupting, they're going to pause for you to, to interject at some point. And usually it's a pretty quick point. And you're going to have to pull additional information out to get them. The, the biggest mistake we make is starting to fix it. So the best thing that we can do is not fix it, just listen. Just keep being curious. Keep asking more about what's going on and what's driving these feelings for them. Because what happens when you do that? They start to solve their own stuff, right? It's like talking to a good friend. I mean, the minute I get with my girlfriend, it's like it's this place where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, never mind. I'm good. I just figured it out. Oh my God, it just came to me. This is awesome. And really, all I needed was to get it out of my head. And most people operate that way as well, and youth are no different. They just need a place to emote it so that they can hear it. And sometimes they'll be like, whoa, that sounded crazy when I said it, right? And so then they can hear how, it's, how it sounds. But in your head, you know, it's kind of like you looking in the mirror and you're like, do I look good? And then your brain's like, mm -mm. right? Because that's your brain. That's your self-esteem. But then you're like, come on, really? And your brain's like, mm-mm. But then you go to your friend, and they're like, oh, man, that's awesome. Or you can tell, and they're like, oh, okay, I will change. Right? I mean, you know immediately. So our, our job is to listen, let them emote. And then our job, ultimately, we don't have to fix this. This isn't ours to fix, folks. <clears throat> Though as family, we're not going to be able to help ourselves, right? As people, we're not going to be able to help ourselves. I know you guys. You're here because you're fixers. Only the fixers used to show up. So how do you persuade someone to stay alive, right? You listen. And then you're going to say, you know what? Remember, suicide's not the problem. It's only a perceived and solvable problem, right? I mean, they think this is going to solve their problem. But it doesn't solve the problem. So our job isn't to talk them out of it. Our job is simply to say, you know what? If it's the, to me, I always say, if it's the right thing, it's going to be there way down the road. We don't have to worry about that right now. If it's the right thing, it's going to stay the right thing. It's not going to wax and wane. Right? It's like that relationship where you're like, oh my God, this is, it, this is it. You just know it's it, right? It's those things. So part of this is that it doesn't come and go. And so you gotta let people just kind of go, you know what, you're right. Let me let's figure this out. Let's work together. What does this what can we do together to get help? So we're gonna ask, will you go get help with me? We let let me help you to find someone to help. We promise me not to kill yourself until we find some help. Right? As adults, you know, hopefully you guys are going to have that list. I don't know what's behind me, but something's going on. So, our goal is to have that list and to know what that is and, and to know what resources we've got locally. We have so many mental health resources at this point. Now, we don't have crisis for youth here. We don't have a facility where we can give kids that need to be inpatient. We don't have a place to do that, but we have the WISE program. We have lots of programs that will do youth counseling and will come to the schools to work with youth. So part of it is early intervention results in a lot less treatment, but getting to treatment is really the start. And then the professionals will help guide you to the next steps. Persuading, so our, you know, our job really is just to say, hey, I'm going to join you. I want to work with you. Let's let's do this together, and let's make sure you're in a good place, and we can kind of get you to who needs the help. 
and then we're going to refer them on, right? So suicidal young people often believe they can't be helped, so sometimes we got to say more, right? Sometimes they really believe that they can't be helped. And most of the time, it doesn't take long to, once you're kind of at this point, they recognize that they want help. They recognize that things could be different or they want it better. And so if they've been listening to themselves, what you'll see is most of them will shift it. But they've got to have that conversation. So ultimately, the goal is to get someone directly to someone that can take uh, them in. During the day, Columbia Valley Community Health has a walk-in uh, program. And so they will do walk-in. So they have psychologists. I created that program. So they have psychologists on, on staff that will see people within less than 30 minutes. <coughs> At um, Cascade Medical, they have Dr. Maholi and Katie Walker that will, will do some of the same stuff and see walk-in people. I hope you guys do that. Okay, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to speak for you. And then uh, Confluence Health. One of the last things I did before I left Confluence was make sure that there is a, a walk-in psychologist, so the, at the walk-in clinic, and so, and then all of the medical practices have an integrated provider available to see people. So regardless of where you are connected anywhere in our valley, you should be able to access some mental health pretty quickly. And so that's our, our ultimate goal. And then I get a lot of questions around, do I stay, do I leave this person, what does that mean? I think as a, as a school, obviously, you probably wouldn't until you passed off or handed off appropriately. But as a family, you know, you have to say, you know, do, how do I feel about this? Is this someone that I'm still worried about? Or is this an imminent? If it's a friend and they've posted a suicide message, I mean, part of this is really, you've got to share that with an adult. You've got to share that with someone that you trust that can handle that information and take this to the next level. Never promise to keep a secret, ever. You can't promise to keep this secret because it's too big of a problem. And you can't own that. It's too, it's too big if something goes wrong and it doesn't work. So you say, I want you to live. I'm on your side. We'll get through this. Who else can you get involved? You know, this is family, friends, brothers, sisters, pastors, priests, coach, medical providers, counselors, basically anybody in someone's life. You, if I usually have my patients tell me someone that you would like to, to know about this information and, and work to support you. And if they can list those people, they're more likely to follow through. They're more likely to be involved. But if I have to make up that list for that person, I always tell them I'm not a very good picker. So I'm going to usually pick that person you're having a problem with. So it's important that, that you pick and for me. Because the truth is, is I have, to, I have to disclose this information. I can't be the only one that knows about this. I care about you. So I want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So who can we do that with? Express concern and compassion. So some of the stuff, you know, when we look at the research that's been done is how, how do we work with people that have kind of similar to your community have gone through this or people that are struggling with these thoughts, right? So we're expressing our concern and compassion. We're talking openly, honestly, and showing that we care. We're remembering that talking helps, right? This is not something that we should just be muffled. <coughs> listening, right? Youth need to talk. We need to be listening. Don't cut them off. Don't fix it. Uh, maintaining connection. Research is very clear that connection is what works, right? We're communal. I think sometimes when we, we're texting, and I ask my kids, like, who are you texting? And he's like, I'm texting him. <laughs> the, the texting the people sit next to them, right? And so I think while that is their world, the truth is is that our job is to still be, be present. Sometimes they just need someone, even if they feeling connected sometimes is that person sitting next to them texting them, you know? And I think we have to figure out what that is. Trusting your gut. Do you trust that you can trust this person? Like, does your gut say, oh, they're good, and I can go do my thing? Or does this person need the next layer of help today, right now, in this moment? And I, and I would say, really, at the point that you've got a serious threat, you're taking it serious and you're moving it along. Remove the means, so always remove the means out of your house, out of, away from them, making sure someone knows about that so that they are taking care of it. Um, 
just a story about my own family. So my family has, my brother has, you know, we live, we're, come from Wisconsin. My brother has four kids. They all went through uh, gun safety, right? He's an avid hunter and really big into all of that. And the truth is, is that, you know, he had a big gun uh, cabinet. They were all locked up. But, you know, his son, his 13-year-old son at the time, knew how to access the weapons. And so at some point, um, he had four other friends over. My brother came home from work and he could hear the cock of the gun as he walked in. And he, his heart, you know, dropped and then he booked it up the stairs to find his son in his room with four other friends and a gun that he had just cocked. And his son goes, whoa, you know, it's not loaded. And my brother grabs the gun and of course he looks and there's one bullet in that chamber. Of course, that's always the story. And, you know, my brother says to me, well, he went through gun safety. And I was like, gun safety can't compete with peer pressure. It can't compete with wanting to be cool. So I think we have to remember that, that while you do go through gun safety, it's not enough when you have friends being like, come on, man, let me see that. What's that look like? Let me, let me feel it. Because the truth is, is that they don't, they, they don't have the skills to manage that type of conversation. So what can we do as a community? So training and suicide prevention, the gatekeeper training has lots of data around helping people, helping youth, helping schools, helping communities. There's billions of people that have been trained across the world in this. We know that it helps. The research, as we have rolled this training out in our first year, 3,200 people got trained in the gatekeeper training, 2,500 the following year. We, we dropped from 30 down to 13, down to eight, based on that training. Um, and then new research on youth uh, choosing. So there was this research study that came out um, in 2018 that had youth ask, talk about um, three, or it was 2017. So at, tell us three or four people in your life that you think are important to get trained in, the, in suicide prevention. And so the youth listed this off. They went ahead and they trained these people. And what they found was those youth that were at high risk, their risk dropped dramatically by getting the people in their life trained in suicide prevention to recognize the signs, the symptoms, and when things were starting to change and what they would do about it. And what they found was those communities that did that as a practice did better. And so um, I think we're going to see moving forward that this is research that's probably going to be uh, duplicated in other communities. Uh, I said at the beginning that risk remains high uh, for all <clears throat> students, not just the friends of a student that might die for two years. Um, and school-wide interventions that are not short-term, so what often happens is we do a quick, we're going to wrap around the students, we're going to do some quick stuff, we're going to bring people in, and then it goes away. And what, what they're saying and what, they're, what the research is showing is that because the risk is two years, there needs to be more. There needs to be a prevention uh, that gets built into the school around this type of thing. There should be groups, there should be other activities, not one and done. Uh, School-based screening and psychoeducation programs. So um, that's part of kind of what we're, as a suicide prevention coalition, we're working on a universal screening protocol that would be best practice that could be adopted into different schools, and then also looking at other things that might help uh, to, to build in around that for curriculum. Um, normalizing mental health, so I think that's everybody's job, right? I think the more that we can make mental health really normal, I mean, the truth is, is 83% of unfounded somatic complaints your body, right? So bodily complaints, I have a stomach ache, I have a headache, I have a shoulder ache. Those types of complaints are unfounded, but are driven by psychological processes, right? So people go to see a primary care provider, and then get, you know, they get told there's, there's nothing. I tested, I looked, there's, there's nothing going on. But what we find is that it's driven by some form of psychological issue that could be solved if we had someone skilled in managing those problems i.e. the integrated model. Um, and then, so part of that is, right, having, assisting in a pathway to professionals. So part of what I recommend to schools all across, I, I speak all over the nation, but I recommend it especially locally, is that we have systems in place. So 
Your job now is to develop the pathways between the school to the professionals and what it looks like when you've got a student in trouble. Right? So I've done lots of work with Wenatchee High School, with Eastmont. Uh, when they have a student that's struggling or kicked out or suspended or doing something, what does it now look like for the school to pick up and say, okay, we just suspended this youth, when can they get in? Or we've got a youth that's struggling with suicide, when can they get in? And literally, get, get them here now, 20 minutes. Give them, get, them, get them over to me or someone in, in my, on my team. And so part of that job is the school to connect to the resources to make sure that those are part of just how you do business. That doesn't go away with time. Parents need to address the difficult conversations at home and allow their kids to talk uh, about the loss and the grief. So there's lots of research on, you know, there's a trauma that kind of happens after a loss. And, and mostly it creates this sense of shock that youth don't know what to do with, and sometimes this will be the first loss they've ever experienced, and they don't really understand what it's bringing up, and it's our job to allow them to kind of go through that. And so what they say is usually the first months of that are them kind of muddling through the trauma of it, but then they get into their own grief reaction, and that comes later, and I think sometimes as adults we're like, let's move on. You know, the truth is, is in our society today, we give people three weeks after a funeral, three weeks, get it together. We had the drowning at the high school. You know, a year later, we were still seeing youth that were impacted by that death. Because it wasn't a small deal, but our culture says you got to wash it away and move forward. Having services, programs, clubs in the school that target prevention and lower risk. So we know that the, you know, there's a lot of research on peer groups, on peer-based interventions that show that peer support is really a solid way to make sure that this doesn't happen to the youth that are at risk in the schools. So school protocols around risk identification and pathways um, moving forward. And then the number one thing that can be done, so obviously families removing the means, making sure that things are locked up, um, and then there's now lock boxes around town where you can drop off meds, so that is um, new over the last couple of years. Addressing and treating mental health issues, I think sometimes we worry about getting early treatment, but the, the more we access treatment early before it becomes really problematic, the, the easier it is for us to make sure that we, it takes a lot less time to fix the problem, basically. So the earlier we get help, the, the shorter the treatment. And then addressing the source of the concern. So if we have bullying that's happening, starting bullying prevention in schools, making sure that we are addressing that that's not a culture we're going to allow and we're going to take care of it. Acceptance, making sure that we are accepting everyone and that, that everybody has a place. Abuse, loss, support, looking at grades. If you've got someone that is changing in their grades, that we are kind of pulling them in. The number one thing that someone did for me when I was younger was, you know, I had a health teacher that we were running um, after class and she pulled me aside and said, hey, I'm worried about you. Are you okay? And to this day, I credit my future with her because she literally stopped and cared. And that was it. I had no one as a kid that did that, but she did it. And I think those are those moments that we take with us. And so it doesn't take a lot to do that for someone. So we're advocating to make sure that something's being done. What we know is research is showing that while people show up to their primary care, and even if they say, yes, I'm suicidal on that PHQ form, the patient health questionnaire, which is a depression screen, only 50% of those are being addressed in real time. I looked at 1,500 screeners that went through Confluence Health. And out of that, when I looked to see, did the people that got the PHQ, did they get referred appropriately? In the chart was uh, the, the problem of depression actually addressed in a way that it should have been, and were they referred on to appropriate resources if they were suicidal? And I followed it through. Only 27% of the people that had a very high score or were suicidal got good care. The research shows it's 50%. We don't have 50% in our community right now. We have to make that a priority. And then we know that mental health, even though someone said, yes, I'm suicidal on a mental health intake, 50% of those people did not get that addressed during that intake because we're so busy focusing on what we're supposed to get done. And people struggling with health can't always advocate, so we need to make sure that we're helping them advocate. 
Other things we can do, checking in with youth. So frequent check-ins, making sure, hey, are you good? You know, I know you were having a hard time. How are you doing this week? Right? And just making sure. Building resiliency and self-esteem in the classroom and at home. Teaching self-care. Creating youth groups in schools. Letting youth design it uh, with the help from adults. At Wenatchee High School, they developed a group called HOPE, which uh, stood for Helping Others Pain Ends. And then uh, through the QPR Institute, they developed a group called the Hope Squad that they <coughs> implement into schools. And that Hope Squad wraps around students that teachers identify as being uh, on the fringe, as struggling with depression, or needing wraparound services, um, and then able to join that. So uh, that's kind of my last slide.